We're gathering here today at a time that the war drums are again beating loudly. They seem to never stop in mainstream media in Washington, spewing lies and distortions now about this season's enemy, Iran. It's a, a pretty sad rerun of what we went through in 2002, but now we have a Democrat in the White House. And uh, we have record military and war spending with the Democrat in the White House and a Democrat majority in the U.S. Senate. I'd like you to think that if a Republican had been in the White House and then tripled the number of troops in Afghanistan, wouldn't we have seen mass demonstrations in the street against such an escalation? But we didn't see it. If a Republican were in the White House threatening yet another military adventure in Iran, you'd expect today to see really big demonstrations in the street. With the Republican presiding over these policies, you'd expect to see a mass online group like Move On challenging the warmongering, standing up for civil liberties, but we're not seeing that either. In fact, we've heard a lar uh, very loud silence from groups like that. Wouldn't it be great if there was a mass online activism group that stood up against war and warmongering no matter which party was in the White House? And those cute little green leaflets that David Swanson made tells you about a group like that. And of course, Code Pink is doing that kind of organizing too. But there's a new group. How many people before they came in today had heard of rootsaction.org? Uh, I encourage you to uh, go to rootsaction.org and sign up if you want to be part of a mass online force that opposes war and warmongering, no matter who's in the White House. Okay, I'm going to introduce our panel one at a time. Uh, they're going to make short opening statements. It's good that we have a, sort of an intimate setting here. Uh, every, people can get a chance to talk. Uh, but we're going to have three opening statements. Um, it's their choice whether they want to go to the podium or, stand at, or stay here at the table. Our first speaker is a prolific writer and blogger an activist for peace. He's the author of War is a Lie and When the World Outlawed War. He's the editor of the Military Industrial Complex at 50. His website is warisacrime.org. Years ago, he was the communications director for ACORN, the anti-poverty organization. He's now a campaigner for rootsaction.org, the online group I just mentioned. David Swanson. Thank you, Jeff. It's, it's an honor to be here with these panelists and to be at this event uh, and to have been at Zuccotti Park uh, last night and to uh, have left, uh, have had to leave uh, too early to get uh, beaten by any police. Um, I, I, I left and ran to a, a pizza place and walked in there and they looked at me like I was a Martian and explained that I was the only person who had been in there that evening who wasn't drunk. <laughs> last night, in Staten Island, a young man was celebrating his wedding engagement and was stabbed to death. Last night in Queens, a party on the third floor apartment crashed it down into the second floor. My unscientific estimation, at least two-thirds of the people on the streets of New York last night uh, had alcohol in them. And where was the NYPD? At the only gathering of sober, nonviolent people in this city beating them up, beating them up and following them to another square and beating them up and arresting them. When Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, where was the Louisiana State Guard? In Iraq. Right? We don't, this is something worse than having our priorities wrong. Our priorities now are harming people rather than helping people. I'll tell you what the military industrial complex is in one sentence. It is a banker bailout every year. It is over a trillion dollars a year through various departments and as much as all other nations' militaries combined. 
It is over half of federal discretionary spending every year. This is not counting the sales to foreign democracies and dictatorships that make the United States the top weapon supplier to the globe and allow our military the odd distinction of fighting most of its wars against weapons produced in the homeland formerly known as our own country. But it is counting the weapons that we give to other countries. Yesterday, even the Washington Post said it'd be a good idea to stop arming Egypt. They didn't mention Israel. And it is counting the transformation of our local police forces into mini militaries. With due respect to Mayor Bloomberg, the NYPD is not the seventh largest military in the world. It just thinks it is. And we don't get the trillion dollars a year back again. In fact, we borrow it and pay interest on it, hollowing out our economy, creating a giant trade deficit with China, keeping interest rates super low, and periodically crashing Wall Street and bailing it out. And when we have big wars, we borrow and spend more money on top of the standard military budget. The trillion dollars is to make us ready in case we have a war, and then the war costs are extra. And the money for the war preparation and for the wars goes in large part to a department free from effective oversight, a department that routinely misplaces, loses, or otherwise cannot explain the location of piles of cash larger than what we spend on most other functions of government. Whatever you think of the recent bombing of Libya, the key fact is not that the president never got congressional approval, but that he didn't need to financially speaking. The cost of bombing Libya was covered by spare change lying around in a drawer at the Pentagon. And when the Pentagon spends money, it spends a growing share of it on so-called private corporations through contracts that are increasingly awarded without even a pretense of competition. And the war profiteers, the 1% of the 1% rake in that loot, but turn around and feed a little pinch of it. It doesn't take much to Congress members and presidents by funding their campaigns. This is in large part who paid for all those TV ads that Marcy Kaptur could just afford and Dennis Kucinich could not. And then the profiteers do something else. They build their weapons in little pieces in as many separate congressional districts as possible before assembling them in yet another district. And our misrepresentatives in Washington defend those weapons, even the ones that won't kill anybody, even the ones designed for 19th century warfare as jobs programs. A Bloomberg News columnist named Amity Schles goes so far as to claim that US troops based in over 150 other countries are there as economic aid, and withdrawing them would hurt foreign economies because soldiers buy stuff. But of course, they also kill stuff. Their job is murder, and whether they give the corpses proper Muslim sea burials or urinate on them, the problem is that they are producing corpses. Other forms of economic aid don't do that. Other forms of government spending, in fact, every other form of government spending on green energy, on infrastructure, on education, even tax cuts for non-billionaires, produces more jobs than military spending. Military spending is worse than nothing economically. It ought to be the chief target of anyone opposed to poverty, wealth concentration, or economic instability. Yet how many labor unions or child advocacy groups are taking on the war machine? The AFL-CIO, by the way, needs to seek medical treatment for its premature erectile dysfunction disorder because you know, th this is an organization that would you know, endorse a dead possum if it was a Democrat. Military spending also takes money that could have been spent on schools, health, transportation, housing, environmental catastrophe avoidance, and a social safety net, and blows it on bombs, drones, aircraft carriers, and billionaires. It is not a series of coincidences that other wealthy nations lacking our level of military spending have a fairer distribution of wealth, better schools, more sustainable energy systems, and longer life expectancies. Even if you believe the Pentagon is saving your life, it is indisputably shortening your life. Military spending should be the top target of anyone who thinks free college would be an improvement over college at the cost of debt slavery. And as Eisenhower warned 51 years ago, investment in planning for war does not prevent war, but rather builds momentum in war's favor. And with the wars, we lose our civil liberties. 
The ACLU is upset that Obama believes he can legally murder anyone anywhere. But the ACLU is not prepared to address military spending. Military spending should be the top target of anyone who'd like to see habeas corpus restored or the Bill of Rights restored or expanded. And unlike government spending on mass transit or windmills, military spending destroys our natural environment. The U.S. military is our top consumer of petroleum and itself consumes a significant share of the oil it fights its wars over. Our country is pockmarked with military Superfund sites. The first question every mother giving birth in Fallujah asks the doctors is, is it normal? And if those pushing for a crisis with Iran manage to get the Strait of Hormuz mined, the Pentagon has plans to send dolphins through it. Military spending ought to be the top target of those who want to maintain a habitable ecosystem. But it isn't, is it? Have you ever heard of a Sierra Club opposition to a war? While fewer U.S. citizens die in war, huge numbers of Iraqis, Afghans, and others lose their lives or see their lives and homes ruined. Refugee crises are a result of war. Half the refugees in the world now are Afghan or Iraqi. Military spending ought to be the top target of those opposed to murder. We haven't eliminated slavery or rape from the world, but we don't invest our children's unearned pay in promoting them on a massive scale. Why should war be different? Our own government's experts know that our wars make us less safe, that if they do not destroy our natural environment, they will produce deadly blowback of another form, and as nuclear weapons proliferate, the possibilities for accidental or deliberate Armageddon increase exponentially. But here's the good news. If everybody whose dreams and goals are being derailed by out-of-control military spending were to join together and nonviolently oppose it, it wouldn't have a chance. And that mobilization has begun as part of the Occupy movement. The defunding of the military has not, however, yet begun in any serious way. Cuts that you hear about, cuts made so far, have either been cuts to future dream budgets, actually increases, or cuts to one department that shuffle money to another department. The cuts mandated by the failure of the super committee would be actual, if minimal, cuts, but there is a push coming from both the Congress and the White House to undo them for the military and increase them for everything else. What keeps this madness humming along and makes wars so hard to end once begun is a pack of twisted logic, fantasies about humanitarian war, and perverse partisanship that opposes wars selectively depending on who is president. In a spirit of sociopathic illness, I've drafted a list of 10 reasons why the United States keeps troops in Afghanistan. And I'll close with these 10 reasons. Michael Moore on this stage last night asked us to try humor and I take him seriously. So if you don't like sarcasm, well, I'm really, really sorry. Uh, number one. These are reasons why we should keep troops in Afghanistan. Number one, when you are setting a record for the longest modern war, cutting it short just increases the chances that somebody else will break your record someday. Number two, when Newt Gingrich and Cal Thomas and Donald Trump turn against a war, keeping it going will really confuse Republicans. Number three, if we pull U.S. troops out, after they have shot children from helicopters, kicked in doors at night, waved Nazi flags, urinated on corpses, massacred villages, and burned Korans, it will look like we're sorry they did those things. Number four, U.S. tax dollars have been funding our troops and through payments for safe passage on roads have also been the top source of income for the Taliban. Unilaterally withdrawing that funding from both sides of a war at the same time would be unprecedented and could devastate the booming Afghan economy. Number five, the government we've installed in Afghanistan is making progress on its torture program and drug running and now supports wife beating, but it has not yet mandated invasive ultrasounds. We cannot leave with a job half finished. <laughs> Number six, we have an enormous prison full of prisoners in Afghanistan and closing it down would distract us from our essential concentration on pretending to close Guant Guantanamo. Number seven, unless we keep winning in Afghanistan, it will be very hard to generate enthusiasm for our wars in Syria and Iran 
And with suicide, the top killer of our troops, we cannot allow our men and women to be killing themselves in vain. Number eight, if we ended the war that created the 2001 authorization to use military force, how would we justify our special forces operating in over a hundred other countries, the elimination of habeas corpus, or the legalization of murdering U.S. citizens? And if we stay a few more years, we might find an Al-Qaeda member. Number nine. A few hundred billion dollars a year is a small price to pay for weapons bases, a gas pipeline, huge profits for generous campaign funders, and a perfect testing ground for weapons that will be absolutely essential in our next pointless war. And number 10, this is probably the most important reason, terror hasn't conceded defeat yet. With his top 10 list, he's the anti-war movement's David Letterman. Um, I don't think you'll see that on CBS soon. Um, when David talks about the AFL-CIO, they'd endorse a dead possum as long as it was a Democrat. He worked at the Labor Communications Association across from the AFL headquarters in DC a few years ago, am I right? Yeah, the what? International Labor, which, right. which moved across the street into the headquarters when the AFL lost half its membership and money. All right. Uh, thank you, David. Our next speaker has been a radio host and a commentator. In 1977, he co-launched America's Black Forum, which was the first nationally syndicated black news interview show on commercial TV. Ten years later, he launched Wrap It Up, an early hip-hop music show nationally syndicated on radio. He co-founded in 2002 The Black Commentator, and in 2006, Black Agenda Report, where you'll find his writing today. He's the author of The Big Lie, an analysis of US media coverage of the Grenada invasion, Glenn Ford. The Occupy Wall Street movement uh, has become the great popularizer of the ills of economic and political inequality for the American people. Since the fall of last year, Americans have undergone a crash course in public education on the evils that flow from the concentration of capital in the hands of a few, or what they call the 1%, who are then enabled to use the power of lopsided wealth to distort the political economy of the United States in ways that further magnify the power of that tiny privileged minority. The greatest contribution, I think, of the Occupy movement to date has been to create a national conversation of how wealth begets wealth, and that concentrated wealth among the few begets growing poverty among the many. They are now growing to understand that democracy is a farce when money buys political power, the power of the state. The American people, many of them now, feel diminished by the flaunting of the American 1%'s power over the American 99%. Hopefully, they're beginning to understand how much of the world feels about the United States and Western Europe, whose rise to relative wealth over the last 500 years has been at the expense of the vast majority of the rest of the world's population. The world as we know it has been shaped, in fact created, by the methodical seizure and exploitation of the Earth's human and natural resources by a tiny minority of the human race who came to call themselves white and who convinced themselves, including those among them who remained without personal wealth, that they deserve to be at the top of the human hierarchy on this planet. It was self-evident to them that they had a special place on the planet that had been reserved for Europeans and the descendants of Europeans, that God had given it to them or that they had somehow earned it, or maybe both. Maybe they had earned, you know, the favor of God. 
And so even the relatively poorer and working class Europeans and white Americans won for themselves reforms in worker rights and in democratic rights. The dictatorship, however, over the colonized people of color became deeper and more brutal and more systematic and more hellishly efficient. In the 1880s, as Germans were enjoying their first comprehensive social welfare legislation, the United States was drawing lines along with the Europeans on the world map. In Berlin, they were dividing up the planet into zones for super exploitation of the planetary vast majority. Super exploitation of that vast majority of the human race would create obscene profits that would trickle down enough to avoid total immiseration of the workers in the so-called advanced countries. And they were advanced because of the enforced backwardness of the rest of the world. Today, the 1% in the advanced countries in the United States have found ways to make their own 99% redundant. Wall Street deploys its army and its navy and its air force to enforce a global race to the bottom and demands that their own 99% get into that race. And from now on, there will be no trickle down from imperialism's global system of super exploitation, only downward mobility for the 99%. The Occupy Wall Street movement and the American people at large can no longer avoid the truth that they cannot break free from the race to the bottom until the war machine that enforces the terms of that race to the bottom is destroyed. That war machine is called U.S. imperialism. And when it is destroyed, that is when the next chapter of world history begins. I feel privileged to believe that I might even see that day. Thank you. One of the great uh, propagandists for US imperialism in the New York Times is Thomas Friedman. And the line I've never, ever forgotten from Friedman is, you know, we can't have McDonald's proliferating without the, uh, throughout the world without McDonnell Douglas. Can't have General Motors without General Dynamics. Um, all right, our last speaker, and then we'll turn it over to the group. Uh, she co-founded the human rights group Global Exchange and co-founded Code Pink. Whenever there's a fight against war or corporate exploitation, it's there you'll find her at the barricades whether it's against the World Trade Organization in Seattle or against the Israeli blockade of Gaza. She's the author of numerous books, co-editor of How to Stop the Next War Now, which I think needs to be reissued. She's got an upcoming book, uh, Drone Warfare, Killing by Remote Control, couldn't be more timely, forward by Barbara Ehrenreich. Uh, who remembers what the first company to get a contract before the war in Iraq began was? Halliburton. Halliburton, okay. Five billion dollars before the war began, and whose company was that? Cheney. Dick Cheney's. Okay, just in case you need your brain to be kind of reinforced with the vicious circle that goes on between the uh, war contractors and the, uh, and the government. Um, let's see, another one. Uh, what is... Um, what are the two top sources of funding for the Taliban? And us. Okay, that's uh, to see if you were listening to David Swanson. The first one is drugs, and the second is your tax dollars, right? Um, and um, did anybody pay attention to a poll that came out that said what percentage of people think that it's okay to uh, kill suspected terrorists with U.S. drones? Oh, no, not, this, not in the 70s. Couldn't possibly be 70%. That's right. Uh, 83%. <laughs> and uh, last one in the quiz, who are the top three producers of drones in the world in terms of co countries? 
Number one is. Number one is. U.S. US. Number two is. Yes, right. Number three is. Britain. No, not Germany, not Britain. It's a big country. Produces a lot of weapons. It's even bigger. Uh, that's right, China. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's um, just a little trivia. So. Uh, David talked about the connections between the, uh, the contractors, the military in industry, and war, and this perpetual cycle that it creates. And I was reading the uh, New York Times last week when it talked about this terrible catastrophe now that a uh, U.S. soldier went on a rampage and killed all of these Afghans, and now the Karzai government is saying, you know, you got to get out of here, you got to at least get out of the streets. And um, they, they, they were um, saying this is so terrible because NATO did a study and said of 158 battalions that the Afghans had, after all these years of training and the billions of dollars of our money that we spent, only one, that's right, one was ready to fight independently. So we couldn't possibly leave because they are not ready to take over. And of course, they're not ready to take over because they have nothing to fight for to defend the Karzai government, right? This is a government that, according to Transparency International, is number three in the world in terms of corruption after Somalia and they say uh, Myanmar. Um, do you think the United States or NATO countries have to go in and teach Afghans how to fight? <laughs> I mean, that on the surface of it is just crazy. But uh, when you have nothing to fight for, uh, there is no government that you have an allegiance to, it's hard to get them to fight, even when our tax dollars are paying for their salaries. Um, they said some of the problems within the Afghan military are a lack of loyalty to the government, very high drug use within the Afghan military, and they said another problem is they keep shooting at us. So um, it does seem like it's going to be very hard, given those statistics, to actually get out by 2014, is, which is what Obama uh, is telling us. Uh, and I think um, this cycle of us giving weapons to countries, um, us using those weapons to destroy things, then sending in the contractors to rebuild, then the contractors subcontract, and the money gets all pilfered out there. By the way, the U.S. own, the own government's study of U.S. and Afghanistan waste and fraud says that some $60 billion of our tax money has just kind of disappeared. And then, of course, the media, what I find, they go and they blame the Afghans and Iraqis, and they say, those corrupt people. But of course, who is making most of the money there? Who is doing most of the corruption? Our companies. And I want to look at this one weapon system drones for a minute because I think it exemplifies all that's wrong in this military industrial complex. Because as David said, these companies are so smart, they produce pieces of the weapons all over the United States so that every congressperson then is getting some money from these weapons companies and then has a personal stake if they want to get reelected. And so Congress people can choose to create their own caucuses, right? They could create a caucus for getting Head Start programs for all the kids who don't have it. They could create a caucus to figure out, you know, how are we going to help these uninsured, uh, uh, the, these students with their uh, exorbitant debts. But instead, this group of 50 created a drone caucus. And the purpose of the drone caucus is to spread the use of drones at home and abroad. Now think of it, these are people that are elected, paid for with our tax dollars, and they're so overtly doing the bidding of the weapons industry. And so the drone caucus pushes for legislation that will allow more sales of drones overseas, increase the use of them, 
that will push the U.S. into more wars to use these drones that we have and to open up the airspace so that we will have domestic drones spying across the border used by every police department in this country. And that's what is coming. What we right, have right now is drones being used as killer drones in countries across the world that the United States people have very little idea it's even happening. Because it's not only in the wars that we have been fighting in Iraq and now Afghanistan, but in Pakistan, and in Pakistan not done by the military, but by, but, uh, by a secret agency, the CIA. So we have no right to know uh, what they are doing, how many people are being killed, what's being done in our name. And then it doesn't stop there. It's also in Somalia and in Yemen, soon to be probably in Uganda. And when the U.S. Uh, government, Obama administration, remember, used drones in Libya, he insisted that they didn't have to even go to Congress to discuss it because there were no U.S. citizens at risk. Because when you use unmanned drones and have no citizens at risk, according to this administration, you don't have to consult Congress. The other thing this administration says, after a long time of not saying anything, is that they have the perfect right to kill U.S. citizens with drones. Because according to Eric Holder, the Constitution does not say that you are due a judicial process. It only says you are due due process. Any snickers there? Well, there would be snickers if you listened to Stephen Colbert talk about it because he had a great segment on drones. And he said, yeah, you know, I guess the founding fathers weren't very picky. You could have a trial by jury. You could have a, uh, a trial by your peers or maybe a trial by fire or a trial by rock, paper, and scissors. Didn't really matter because due process is really just something that you do. And in this case, what you do is the president gets his advisors together. You figure out who you want to kill, and then you go and kill them. That's the due process. And he says, well, you know, in this endless war on terror, there are bound to be collateral damage, and it's just too bad that in this case, it's the U.S. Constitution. And ain't that the truth? And it's unfortunate you have to go to uh, the shows like uh, Stephen Colbert mm -hmm. to get the truth, because you're not reading it in the U.S. media and you're not reading and hearing in this election process that it is the Obama administration that ramped up the use of drones around the world. It's the Obama administration that decided that although it couldn't close Guantanamo, it wouldn't send more prisoners in Guantanamo because it would just kill them instead. And 85% of all the drone attacks have been done by this administration. And so I want to pass out um, one is a sort of bottom line thing on the drones. Let's start at what a lot of us could hopefully agree on. Um, because, as I said, 83% of Americans thought it was okay to kill uh, terrorist suspects with drones. Let's say, let's start by taking it away from the hands of a secret agency called the CIA. So I'm going to pass around a, uh, uh, a uh, sign-up sheet, if you can sign on to saying take it out of the CIA. And we're doing the first ever drone summit at the end of uh, April, April 28th. Uh, end of uh, April, April 28th and 29th in Washington, D.C. First time that people from the human rights community, from the legal community, the scientific community that knows about robotic weapons, uh, folks internationally are all coming to Washington to talk about drones and what are we going to do about it. And it would be great if any of you could join us. Um, and then I just want to end by saying a couple of the things that are happening now uh, around trying to stop the next war in Iran. That is that a moribund uh, uh, peace movement, anti-war movement that really died when the Obama administration came in uh, is trying to put itself back into gear again. There will be a gathering next weekend of a group called UNAC that is coming together and one of the big topics will be how do we stop the war in, uh, in Iran. Um, United for Peace and Justice, another coalition that was very active during the days of the Bush administration but found itself with no funding once Obama came in, is trying to gear up and push for a pledge of resistance where people say they will uh, engage in civil disobedience if there is some kind of attack on Iran. 
Um, we in Code Pink have been approached by women in both Iran and in Israel saying, let's come together as women in these three countries to work together to do something to stop an attack on Iran. And uh, I have been surprised at how much work has to be done within the Occupy movement itself to get these issues to be more prominent in the list of issues that the occupations are taking on. Um, it was very tough when we did our uh, gathering uh, two weekends ago called Occupy APAC when the strongest foreign policy lobby in the United States was meeting to push a war in Iran. It was very hard to get the Occupy movements to endorse it and send representatives. We were thankful that the uh, committee dealing with foreign issues here, uh, foreign affairs, here in uh, Occupy Wall Street did endorse the, uh, um, the Occupy APAC Summit, as did a couple of others around the country, but it was very hard to do. Uh, and so I think we have a lot of work to do going back into the Occupies and giving out some of the statistics that David Swanson started us off with about why this has to be among the top priority issues for the Occupy movement. So we've got a lot of work to do ourselves. Uh, I'm glad that in this New Left Forum there was lots of talk about uh, the problems of war and occupations and the need to bring these together. There are good occupations and those there are in our city squares and there are bad occupations and those are the ones we're doing overseas. Let's distinguish between the good and the bad and let's have the good occupiers stop the bad occupations. Thank you. Thank you, Medea Benjamin. I want to toss out one quick question, uh, which Medea just brought up. What happened to anti-war activism, organizing, protests? In 2008, there was a lot of talk that, well, we can organize these huge demonstrations, but when Bush Cheney are in power, they don't listen to us anyhow, so it's pointless. Let's get the Democrats in there and then uh, organize against them. What happened? David? Well, you're looking for logic. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it, it, logically, if you elected people to office who you thought might be persuadable to your positions, uh, you would then ramp up your activism. Uh, instead, you see, uh, not just in this one example, but almost across the board, the exact opposite approach, uh, in, in large part because uh, many people and organizations and funders uh, carry over to the other 729 days of any two-year period what they do for five minutes in a voting booth and make themselves into the servant of the public servant uh, and believe that pressuring, uh, you know, a better elected official to uh, move in a good direction uh, is, is counterproductive. It hurts them and it benefits the bad party uh, and government is a football game and your job is to root for one team uh, and root against the other team uh, rather than you're the people, they're the government and the confrontation is between uh, a government failing to represent us and a popular movement demanding representation for majority views. Uh, and, and so once you've once you've elected the less hideous choice uh, to office, you know, logically, your next task, your more important task, uh, is to devote the next two years minus a day to pushing them in the right direction. Uh, but predictably, uh, for many, uh, your task is then to leave them alone, to give them a chance. As you'll recall, uh, there was widespread opinion that candidate Obama for the first time in the history of elected politics was going to be better than his promises. He was pretending to be worse than he would be. Uh, and, and so you had to give him a chance. And if he continued that pretense a little bit, well, it was 12-dimensional chess. And, you know, those who are better than us work in mysterious ways, and we should give them a chance. Uh, and it, it, I think that that's all regardless of whether you make a rational, lesser evil choice in a voting booth where, you know, of course, you want to be rational, you don't vote because one vote doesn't decide an election, but regardless of what you do in a voting booth, if you cripple yourself for the other 
729 days, uh, you're, you're doing far more damage uh, than however you might have voted or not voted. And in terms of lessers of, of evils, and we said it from uh, this podium yesterday, so might as well say it again, uh, we don't consider Barack Obama to be the lesser evil. We consider him to be the uh, more effective evil. And he's a more effective evil specifically because you guys let him be the more effective leader because he can nullify the Constitution and ignore totally uh, international uh, law and get away with it. And George Bush uh, cannot get away with it, at least scot-free. And so it is the behavior of the Democratic base uh, to Barack Obama that allows him to be the more effective evil. I want to make some self-criticism in looking back over the Bush years because I think um, we had a lot of infighting within our organizations that sapped a lot of people's energies. We did a lot of things in old-fashioned ways that made young people feel it wasn't very interesting to get involved in the anti-war movement when people were getting on buses and going to Washington, D.C. on a weekend to walk around places where uh, the buildings were all closed uh, to hear speakers say the same thing one after another after another um, to be given uh, pre-printed placards to hold up. Uh, when you compare some of those tactics to the more vibrant Occupy, you can see why there are a lot more young people involved in the Occupy movement. Um, I also think that uh, eight years of doing uh, pretty nonstop uh, anti-war activism wore a lot of people out. And then came the financial crisis, and that is a very real crisis. It took a lot of people out of the movement. I know we had a very vibrant peace house in Washington, D.C. as Code Pink, where we would house about 20 people at a time who'd be coming in from outside, and they'd spend a couple of weeks in D.C. and march to the Hill and do things in Congress. And people just couldn't afford to come anymore, couldn't afford to take off time from work, had to spend time looking for work, couldn't afford the airfare. Um, many of our organizations have folded because they couldn't get funding anymore. So it was a combination of factors, but it is extremely unfortunate that a time when we are now facing another possible war, really a potentially hugely catastrophic war, even worse than the ones that we've just uh, been through and are still in in Afghanistan, uh, and we don't have the kind of vibrant movement we need to confront it. Let's go right to that. What, what, are our, what do we expect is going to happen in Iran? When do we think it's going to happen? What will be the reaction of activists? Um, it's exciting to hear Medea talk about Iranian women and Israeli women and U.S. women already trying to uh, g gather together to try to prevent that uh, military attack. But what, what, let's look in the crystal ball and what we're expecting. And someone should mention this article in Mariv. David, maybe. Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, clearly there's no discussion of a need to get the Congress to approve of a war, to get the United Nations to approve of a war. We've just seen uh, Leon Panetta tell Senator Sessions that no, uh, the White House will not tell uh, Congress, will not ask Congress for permission to start a war in Syria or Iran or anywhere else. It will inform Congress of that war when it happens uh, and will not uh, go to the United Nations for authorization for any war. That if NATO starts a war, that makes it legal. That if NATO won't do it and an ad hoc coalition of three other countries will, that makes it legal. Uh, you know, any, any war is legal according to these people. So, that, so if we see a war started uh, in Iran by Israel or by the United States, uh, it, it will not be without the, the bother of lying to Congress or persuading the United Nations. It will simply start. Uh, we, we have reports now that Obama has agreed, uh, unlike Bush, to provide Israel with the bombs and the bombers needed uh, in Israel's estimation to attack nuclear sites in Iran uh, on the condition that they not be used until next year, uh, meaning that the U.S. election 
will have passed. Uh, now, if you are on the one hand saying, I don't want a war in Iran, we want diplomacy, uh, we, we, this is not the way to go, but you're upping our so-called aid, our weaponizing of Israel to $3.1 billion next year. You're, you're bragging about your continued commitment to veto any measure of accountability in international forums for any Israeli uh, abuses or crimes, uh, and you're providing Israel with the weaponry to facilitate the attack uh, on condition that they don't do it yet. Uh, but you're at the same, and you're at the same time pushing all the propaganda, uh, the idea that Iran has a nuclear weapons program, even though your own government says it doesn't. The idea that having a nuclear weapons program is a reason to start a war against another country, even though we have one and we don't want a war started against us. You, you know, you're you're talking out of two sides of your mouth, and if if you wanted to persuade Israel not to do this thing, uh, it would certainly be possible not to arm them to do it, not to protect them in doing it, not to facilitate it. Uh, and Iran knows that, and Iran has made very clear that it knows that we know that it knows that. Uh, and a, a strike on Iran uh, by Israel or the United States will result in uh, an attack on U.S. forces by Iran uh, will result uh, in, potentially in the death of 100,000 people, nuclear radiation disaster, uh, and will potentially escalate, uh, yes, into a worse war uh, than we have seen in a half century. One, one of the original sources of this story that Obama has already cut a deal with Netanyahu uh, was Mariv, a newspaper in Israel which has very close connections and very good sources among Israeli intelligence. So it wasn't like a weird conspiracy from people that don't know. And the specific technology that Obama's agreed to give Israel, according to this report, uh, that Bush refused, is the refueling technology that they need and the bunker bomb a bunker busting bomb technology that they don't have yet. And the fact that this could be reported, I know Newsweek is on it now, but it's just stunning that, uh, you know, around the world they're talking about this report that a, cut, a deal has already been cut by our president and Israel's prime minister. And it's just, I, I don't think the New York Times, have they reported this? And, and this, of course, threatens the new model of that Obama will be better than he's promising routine, which holds that make him a lame duck and he'll be good. Oh, he'll be great in that second term. Yeah, you know, the, the, the punditry are uh, all busy dis uh, trying to uh, uh, decide whether Obama intends uh, to go to war or, or not. It's, uh, it's assumed that the Israelis uh, do intend at some point uh, to go to war. Uh, and I don't like to do any uh, psychobabble about what goes on in, in, in Obama's mind, uh, but it's really, uh, it's at some point, becomes almost ir irrelevant because the demonization of Iran uh, that has been going on, of course, for years, but, but now uh, it, 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 at... Uh, uh, at, at the level of screen, uh, creates a kind of momentum of, of its own. Uh, when you gear a country up for war, when you position, uh, prepare the citizenry uh, to uh, trounce on the evil uh, doer, it's, it's very good, uh, very difficult uh, to pull that back. Uh, this becomes uh, like an oil tanker which cannot turn on a dime. And so you, you propel the entire national psyche uh, into this war before you get in the war. And uh, even the most powerful man in the world, uh, the person in the White House, can't turn that oil take tanker around necessarily. And this is not even to mention the ability of the Israelis then to provoke the war any time they feel like it. Well, I totally agree with uh, what Glenn just said because you know you, see, you just see it all being put into place, and uh, I guess I've, I've got uh, 
post APAC syn distress syndrome because having been uh, around that convention two weeks ago, they say that next to the State of the Union, it is the gathering where most elected officials in the United States go. Now just think about that. Hundreds of members of Congress go there. And uh, we were standing outside protesting during the gala, and you just see a stream of Congress people going in there, and the most progressive ones as well. I mean, the Progressive Caucus goes to pray at the altar of APAC. Uh, we were chasing Jesse Jackson down the street, street after street, saying, Jesse, how could you, how could you? And he says, you know, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? They're my constituents. Mm -hmm. And um, we, uh, we always seem to surround John Conyers when he goes there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he tells us he's there to stand up for the Palestinians. <laughs> <laughs> We asked him, did he consult with any Palestinians before he decided that was a good way to stand up for them? And uh, there's a little YouTube we just did where we saw Conyers again in the elevator uh, in Congress a couple of days ago. And uh, we said to him, John, how come nobody talks about Israel's nuclear weapons? How come nobody will say, Israel has 400 nuclear weapons, they don't join any non-proliferation treaty, that's wrong. And he just kind of looked at us and he smiled and ducked out of there. He would not say it. Ask a congressperson straight to their face, does Israel have nuclear weapons? Do you remember when they asked it to Obama once? Yeah. Yeah, what did he say? And Sam Hussein, he corners yeah. senators and asks them, they almost all won't touch it. They, they usually say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is, it's really insane. And so to see the way this powerful lobby of APAC has helped to uh, have this moving ship just be going forward um, towards another war is scary as can be. And then to see how it plays out in the election. You know, it was Super Tuesday. Super Tuesday, a huge day for the Republican candidates. You'd think they would just be on the ground wherever they had to be to be getting out to the constituents. They were at APAC. They were at APAC on Super Tuesday to say which one of them was more pro-war with Iran. And you know, Mitt Romney, Iranians will not get a nuclear weapon if you elect me. And so, so it is moving the whole policy towards the right, towards a war, and it's moving Obama in a direction of war as well. And uh, there are lots of people in our military that say this is crazy. We do not want to go with a war with Iran. This is the wrong thing to do. If they make a peep about it, they get shot down immediately. When our Joint Chiefs of Staff said that Iranians were rational players, oh boy, did he get shot down around that and had to take his, that back. Just like Petraeus had to take back when he said that our perceived unconditional support for Israel is harming our soldiers. He had to take that back. So um, the, the Congress is gearing up towards war. Um, this administration is being pushed towards war. And we, the people, better get out there and do something about it, or we're going to have another war on our hands. One, one quick point. Yeah. One quick point. I, I want to talk about the media's role. Cause the well, I, I think it's important that a movement against launching a war on Iran has existed for several years now and has succeeded every day of those mm -hmm. several years. And they never come out and announce your success. It's only when you fail. Uh, there was a huge push in 2006, 2007 that was stopped. And part of how it was stopped was they couldn't get the polls of, of U.S. citizens who wanted a war with Iran above 10%. And part of the reason for that was because the lies were so damn similar to the lies about Iraq that everybody knew about. And it was those lies about Iraq being exposed that turned people against that war. Yeah, and, the, right. and, and it's fading. It's fading. We have to keep bringing back those lies. I think the, you're right, I think the public's skepticism may be fading and the corporate media's revving up for war is intensifying. I mean, to me, how many people get information from FAIR or FAIR.org or listen to Counterspin? I mean, FAIR is on fire in these last few months because the lies about Iran are just intense. It's just like we're back in late 2002 with the lies about Iraq. And, you know, I think back to the 08 election, one of the typically, you know, shows you the, 
the, the way that the media, mainstream media, are not only wrong, they're usually 180 degrees wrong, was that question that was asked of Hillary Clinton in one of the Obama-Clinton debates where the reporter says, Senator Clinton, if Iran attacks with a nuclear weapon, which they have none, Israel, which of course has hundreds, uh, what would you do? And what should the position of the U.S. be? And Hillary immediately said, they will know that we will obliterate them. Not a country, not a ruling class, we will obliterate them. I assume the them refers to the Iranian people. Uh, but the wrongheadedness here of a country not having a weapon, and that's the question that the media feel they have to put in the faces of those running for president. I mean, look at what, it, uh, what FAIR has exposed just in the last two months. In January, the New York Times reported, quote, a recent assessment by the International Atomic Energy Agency that Iran's nuclear program has a military objective, unquote. Now, FAIR went to the New York Times and said, we want to know what report you're referring to from the IAEA. What assessment is that? The Times had none. They knew it was a mistake. They took the paragraph off of their website and they would not correct their error. They left the impression with all those who didn't notice the disappearing paragraph mm. that there was a IAEA report saying that Iran's nuclear program has a military objective. It does not. On public, so-called public TV, Margaret Warner hosting a segment about Iran and she says, the Iranian government insists that its nuclear activities are for peaceful energy purposes only, an assertion Disputed by the U.S. and its allies on CBS yesterday, Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta repeated international demands that Iran stop enriching uranium. Cut immediately to a quote from Panetta. But we know that they're trying to develop a nuclear capability. That's what concerns us. Our red line to Iran is do not develop a nuclear weapon. They need to know that. If they take that step, they're going to get stopped. There was something that was edited out of Panetta's comment. Because without editing out that, that aspect of Panetta, the whole PBS, so-called public TV report, would not have made sense because they're trying to make this conflict that Iran is moving toward a nuclear weapon. What they cut out of Panetta's response were the words that came immediately before where he said, quote, is Iran trying to develop a nuclear weapon? No, unquote. Now, if this isn't identical to what happened in 2002, 2003 at the New York Times, at public TV, at national public radio, where the lies were just getting, they were ridiculous that an eight-year-old, a 12-year-old with media literacy could expose the lies. But they keep coming, and they're, they're coming with rapidity now around Iran. There is no evidence there is a nuclear weapons program in Iran. And yet we keep hearing, uh, you know, CBS News anchor Scott Pelley. The president, as you know, has been trying to force Iran to give up its nuclear weapons program. How can they say that when, the, when Obama's secretary of defense says there isn't a nuclear weapons program? Now? Okay. Yeah, Glenn. And the insistence of 16 U.S. intelligence agencies that there is no such program. Uh, and clearly under Bush and now under uh, under Obama, uh, you know that's a very scary thing. Not that they uh, that they publicly uh, insist there is no program. Clearly, there is no program, but that uh, they would at least under the Bush scenario buck their own commander in chief mm -hmm. to tell people this. Uh, what do the spooks really know? Why are they so? upset uh, at the prospects of an attack on Iran, that they would, uh, uh, if not violate the uh, chain of command, get their bosses mad. This is not what civil servants routinely do. It's, it's, it's quite frightening. Uh, Israel is waging a uh, covert, uh, not so covert, war against Iran. It is assassinating 
I Iranian uh, uh, physicists. And if Iran were doing anything remotely approaching that kind of, of violation of, 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 of international law, that kind of provocation, uh, that would be considered a, a, cause, a cause for war. And yet Israel is doing it. They do not deny that they are doing it. And the United States seems to have no problem with them doing it. At that kind of level, there already is a war against Iran. And one more way uh, in which this is such a tragic repeat of what we saw around Iraq and shows the profound racism that Glenn uh, talked about is the sanctions. Uh, when we know what the sanctions did to Iraqi children, when we know that Madeleine Albright said it was worth it to kill 500,000 Iraqi children, and yet, we are taking another middle-class society, just like Iraq was. Uh, I have been to Iran. Uh, it it uh, is quite a well-developed country. And squeezing it so hard right now that it's not the leaders who are being hurt, just like in the case of Iraq. It is the ordinary people whose lives are getting more and more difficult. And you can just see it coming how it's hurting the healthcare system, how it's hurting the children. Uh, how profoundly racist are we as a people to allow this to happen to another people with, when we just have to look back uh, 15 years ago to see what we did to the Iraqi people? And after those sanctions and that strategic killing of half a million children in Iraq uh, came shock and awe nine years ago tomorrow or the next day, and, uh, and you had a general asked about, a U.S. general asked about the damage to hospitals and bridges and infrastructure and lives, and he said, well, what do you think the point of the sanctions was? Was it to help the Iraqi people? We are just accelerating what the sanctions were doing. We're doing it faster now. Uh, and, and of course, that is what sanctions do. They create uh, uh, death and destruction, uh, they create a logic that says, well, they haven't worked, because to work becomes not preventing the nuclear weapon, but overthrowing the government. Uh, and they, they, if they fail to provoke an attack, and Iran is showing tremendous restraint, if they fail to do what they did to Japan these many years ago and provoke an attack, uh, then they create a logic and a momentum that says that you must now attack. And it will be perfectly defensible because all you're doing, as the military says, is the work of the sanctions speed it up. Now, I'll admit that I'm overly obsessed with the New York Times, a little bit like the poet Allen Ginsberg had this obsession with Life magazine. But, um, you know, I, I hear what Glenn said about this sense in the United States of entitlement that we, you know, have this, uh, this feeling that we should dominate the world, we're doing it in their interest, and all the rationalizations and all the racism, ethnocentrism behind that. I'm looking at the New York Times yesterday, and they had an article about a biracial uh, black father, Jewish mother, biracial Jewish teen from rural Ohio holds the All-Ireland Dance title. <laughs> Nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with U.S. domination of the world or imperialism or foreign policy, but here was the lead. For those feeling down about the United States and its shrinking place in the world, <laughs> I'm not making this up, meet Drew Lovejoy, 17-year-old from rural Ohio, and blah, 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 and how he won the dance competition in Dublin three years in a row. Like, what the hell? You know, I mean, Glenn, Glenn laid it out sort of uh, in a methodical way, this U.S. sense of entitlement. And here we have in a human interest story, the New York Times can't help themselves. But I mean, when I look back, I mean, I'm looking at what the New York Times is doing now. They will not correct errors that they know are serious errors made in front page stories. And it reminds me of October 2002 when Michael Gordon, who's more powerful than ever, and Judith Miller wrote the story about Iraq getting uh, uh, aluminum tubes. 
It was based completely on unnamed intelligence sources, not the ones Glenn was referring to or speaking out and saying our intelligence does not justify an invasion of Iraq, but the, you know, it was out of Cheney's office and that the aluminum tubes, tubes could only mean Iraq was developing a nuclear weapons program. Complete fantasy. And they get it in the New York Times, and then, and it was right out of Cheney's office. We know all this now. Cheney's uh, office put that in the New York Times, then he appears that day on Meet the Press, and they ask him, and what does he say? Well, look at the front page of today's New York Times, and you'll see what Iraq is up to. And that's what we're going through again today with the mainstream media. You know that song from The Who? Uh, the, the mainstream media don't understand that lyric. Uh, you know, we won't be fooled again. They, they misunderstand. They, you know, it's always, we will be fooled again. After the Iraq invasion and no weapons of, you know, this isn't going to happen again. The mainstream media apologized and they wrote uh, corrections. And, and sure enough, they're doing exactly what they do in advance of every military adventure. And if you want to know uh, the best book and movie on that subject of how the president and the punditry and the media whip us up into every war, the best book on that is called War Made Easy by Norman Solomon. And there's a documentary narrated by Sean Penn called War Made Easy. You can get it and watch it for free online if you want to see how this has happened since the invasion of Dominican Republic, Vietnam, all the way to today, the same media swallowing the same lies. We, in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I live, we take a certain pride in that aluminum tube uh, lie in that in Washington they couldn't get the Department of Energy experts to say that these tubes could possibly be for nuclear weapons. They couldn't get the State Department experts to say it. They couldn't get the Pentagon experts to say it. They couldn't get the people working for Dick Cheney to say it. So they went to the Army National Ground Intelligence Center, which is down in Charlottesville, Virginia, and they found a couple of guys willing to say it and willing to hire a local private contractor to tell them they were right. These guys got huge bonuses. Uh, their careers are doing great. Uh, and Colin Powell put that in his statement at the United Nations, and we went to war over it as they conflated nuclear weapons with other weapons that are far less damaging into weapons of mass destruction and scared the bejesus out of half of this country. Uh, and they will go to that extent and are going to that same type of extent now to create the lies they want. And there are people willing to advance their careers to say what needs to be said, whereas that first contract to Halliburton uh, for several years of profits with no competition uh, out of the coming war was exposed and denounced to Congress by the top official, Bunny Greenhouse, mm -hmm. uh, for awarding these contracts. Who's, who was then locked in a, in a little room, given nothing to do, and told she had a different job description now, uh, and who last year was awarded uh, close to a million dollars in belated compensation, and who came and, and spoke at this conference that produced this book last year, The Military Industrial Complex at 50, and said that it's now worse. It is worse this year than it was three years ago. It has gotten worse since her career was destroyed. We have an increasing share of these contracts going out without any competition or oversight. Uh, and it, it, is, it is crony capitalism uh, on steroids and increasing. Uh, it, these are not trends that we're done with yet. It's not about the, the, the Middle East, it's, it's, uh, it, but it is on the subject of uh, how the New York Times does us. Uh, uh, in, in Haiti, before uh, 2004, uh, before the United States initiated the regime change there. Uh, I learned uh, that the United States was funding uh, a, a bunch of uh, former army uh, soldiers uh, and that they had, were, were being trained in the Dominican Republic, uh, that the Republican Party's international arm was regularly visiting there and they were preparing for an invasion of, of Haiti. I learned all of that in the New York Times. And then this uh, 
this band of, of folk armed and supported by the United States crosses the border uh, and uh, they begin their attack on the, on the Aristide uh, government. And all of a sudden, the New York Times forgets its own mm. reporting. All of a sudden, these guys are uh, indigenous. Uh, that is, it is uh, an uprising from within the country. All of a sudden, there is no Dominican uh, Republic uh, sanctuary and training ground. I learned it in the New York Times, but the New York Times forgot about what it said. And so the New York Times not only uh, 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 makes up stories or, and, and uh, prints falsehoods and then fails to say that it did so, but the New York Times forgets, it, it forgets the truth when it reports it. Yeah, it's a question of timing. You can tell the truth at certain periods, but when you're gearing up, uh, when the action's begun, that's got to go into a memory hole. It's like 1984. All right, we're opening it up here. You start. Short questions or comments. Uh, um, yes, the questions were, uh, let's take the last one first. The, the second question was, do at the New York Times and places like that, do the reporters sometimes resist the editors and have conflict with the editors over this kind of thing? You, some of you know that I was inside mainstream TV news during the run-up to the Iraq invasion. I was at MSNBC. I was on the air every day questioning the invasion and during a 10-minute interview seg uh, a debate segment, and then I got taken off the air. I worked on the Phil Donahue show, and primetime MSNBC. We got taken off the air. So I've seen from the inside that there is often a lot of conflict. I mean, we were in a war with management. Management at MSNBC on the Phil Donahue show in the two months before the Iraq invasion, they had a quota system. They ordered us, every time we had one guest that was anti-war, we had to book two guests that were pro-invasion of Iraq. If we had two on the left, we'd have three on the right. At one meeting, uh, a producer said she was thinking of booking Michael Moore as a guest. She was told she'd have to have three right-wingers for balance. <laughs> I privately thought about, you know, suggesting Noam Chomsky as a guest, but the stage couldn't accommodate the 38 right-wingers we would have needed. So, yes, there is this conflict. Um, now, when it comes to a Michael Gordon, you know, the more he has distorted na national security policy, the more power he got for 20 years. The people that resist management are often the ones that get flung out of the system. The most amazing thing to me is we were to be replaced at MSNBC by Jesse Ventura. It was in all the newspapers. And I always wondered why didn't the Jesse Ventura story why didn't the Jesse Ventura program ever begin? And I wrote a book about it, uh, you know, what happened to us called Cable News Confidential, My Misadventures in Corporate Media. And as soon as the book came out, I got an email from Jesse Ventura. And he said, God, you could have included me in the book. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, they hired me and paid me millions of dollars and when they learned I was as against this stupid invasion of Iraq as Phil Donahue was, they never let me get on the air. So yes, there is that conflict. What I saw in the mainstream in my years there is, it, you know, everyone in society, especially conservatives, oh, I'm for a meritocracy, where people move up based on their achievement and their accomplishments. And, you know, what you have in mainstream corporate media is the opposite. The, there's a dictionary word for it. It's called cacistocracy, rule by the worst, where the people who are the least principled, least talented, least journalistic, they're the ones who move up the chain. There's not one person that lost their job over getting the Iraq war wrong at NPR, at PBS, at the mainstream TV, and all of them did get it wrong. 98% got it wrong and all of them saw their careers promoted upward, and those of us who were in the mainstream that got it right, we were asked all the right questions before the invasion, we were kicked out of the system. So that's uh, uh, that question. There, there was a lame duck question, and I yes, would just say briefly that... Uh, Repeat the question. Uh, well, it's I this concept that Obama, you know, it's all been a trick, his going along with the Wall Street and the military, that you wait for his second term in office where he's going to be an agent of change again. Well, the, you know, because, because our elections are so corrupted 
by money, by corporate media, by gerrymandering and ballot access and the rest of it, that we think of elections in their entirety as a corrupting force. Right? So we want our politicians to ignore us. We want them to be principled and not go by polls and so forth. We want to be left out. There's this whole anti-democratic idea in our, in our own heads. And so we think if, if somebody could be elected with a term limit, so it's their last term, they've got these four years and they don't have to worry about a coming election, those evil elections, uh, then, they'll, then they'll do the right thing that's in their heart of hearts. There'll be a true progressive uh, you know, uh, leader. And uh, of course, these guys that get elected in this system are not true progressive leaders. Uh, that's not what's in their hearts. That's not what influences them. And we ought to want them to care whether they can get reelected or not. Uh, even with the tiny little bit of public influence in our elections that remains. And we ought to clean up our elections so that they all are all routinely threatened with an election. Uh, but the idea that you can reliably expect some Want to get better because they are a lame duck uh, is just not shown uh, by history. Um, and and I, on the reporter question, I would just add that a New York Times reporter, James Risen, in 2004 had a story about us all being spied on without warrants, had an interesting story about the CIA giving Iran the plans for how to make a nuclear bomb, had, had a number of quite interesting stories. And the New York Times, at the request of the White House, said no. You can't print these. Uh, and the New York Times came out with the, the warrantless spying story, has yet to touch most of the other stories along with anybody else. And, uh, over a year later, uh, when Risen came out with a book uh, with his stories in there, uh, and the New York Times explained the delay by saying, if we had printed this story in 2004, it might have impacted an election. Well, what the hell is your job? You know, and, and yet James Risen didn't quit, didn't put the story on a blog, didn't think the American public had a right to know what was going to come out in his book over a year later. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody lost their job for screwing us, but very few people quit and abandoned their jobs to help us either. Uh, a, a quick answer from personal experience about the media. When we had our uh, last year start doing our first uh, uh, focus on, on APAC, we were told by friends in the media, look, this is a really important story, but we're not going to cover demonstrations. Do something serious. Get professors to talk about it, people who are really credible, uh, and then we can cover it. So we did. We had a whole day of discussions last year. Nobody covered it. We did it this year. Uh, and last year, we had the people who wrote the book, The Israel Lobby, professors from Harvard, from University of Chicago. This year, we got all kinds of, you know, a fabulous day worth of uh, uh, discussions focusing a lot on the Iran uh, potential war. Um, media didn't come. C-SPAN wouldn't cover it. They had nothing to cover that day. They just said, sorry, we can't cover it. And then we said, all right, we're going to give it one more shot. They won't come to us. We'll go to them. Let's go to the National Press Club. Let's blow the 500 bucks for a stupid little room. And uh, we get in experts again to come, people from the uh, Iranian-American community, people from uh, professors, blah, blah, blah. We go there, and it's full of cameras and full of media. And we think, wow, OK, now we did it. Uh, nothing came out in the media, nothing. And we called some of the press who was there, and they said, yeah, it was quashed by the editors. You needed Netanyahu to strip naked and have a <laughs> tattoo. We have dozens and dozens of nuclear weapons, Hundreds. and maybe Maybe they would have covered it. Well, one, on the issue of second term's going to be great, remember how great Bill Clinton's second term was when he deregulated Wall Street in 1999 and 2000? Yes. Yeah, um, I'm also the co-founder of a, a, uh, a global exchange that can, has been continuing to take delegations to Iran. Uh, and if anybody's interested, you can look online for Global Exchange because we do believe strongly in citizen-to-citizen -citizen diplomacy, and everybody who goes gets blown away by this amazing civilization and these beautiful, hospitable people. Um, the uh, uh, issue about humanizing has, how many people here have seen the, uh, the Oscar-winning documentary, The Separation? Oh, it is beautiful. It is really wonderful. And I would encourage everybody to see it and tell your friends to see it because it does so much to humanize people and show a, 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 um, a jury system that's actually uh, a lot more interesting than our own here. Um, but um, humanizing people, uh, we 
we're going to create a dialogue with the Iranian People Day um, outside of the halls of Congress. We did this before, years ago, when uh, David talked about how we stopped this last round of war. Um, unfortunately, so many of the groups and individuals we worked with several years ago who could at that time uh, be seen as having friends in the United States now said that it has become too dangerous for them inside Iran because the pressure is now also uh, strengthening the hardliners in Iran um, that they don't want to be seen as being friendly to Americans. So it's making it more and more difficult for us to have those people-to-people -people ties. Can, yeah, I, can I just okay. add that every year Ahmadinejad comes to this city and has peace activists come and have dinner with him and he says, please don't bomb us. And, he, you know, he's not a progressive activist, but he's not a demon. And the, the, the media talks about the confrontation with Iran using the plural for anything the United States does and the singular for Iran. It reduced 75 million people to that one guy and then demonize him. As so they it, did with Saddam Hussein, yes. The, the question, question was, uh, what do we think of Rachel Maddow, who's doing program after program, are, uh, you know, pushing a, uh, let's bring our heroes from the Afghanistan and Iraq veterans and have a big, oh, only Iraq, and a big, uh, a big parade in New York City for the uh, vet war veterans. Some, some very well-intentioned, misguided peace activists in St. Louis originated this idea before she did. Uh, I think that what President Kennedy wrote privately to a friend and never would have said aloud that until conscientious objectors have the respect and prestige that soldiers have, we will not end this madness of war is absolutely right. Uh, I, 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 I think, you know, the, the, you know, the, the primary uh, mission is to stop creating veterans. Uh, not to figure out new ways to honor them. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee uh, last year pushed through Congress and successfully created a, an Iraq-Afghanistan veteran holiday. Right? We, we have, I think, two dozen war holidays throughout the year now at this point with Memorial Day and Veterans Day and Flag Day. And, you know, and we've now added this Iraq-Afghanistan uh, holiday. Nobody cares about it. Uh, nobody knows about it. Um, I, I, I don't think you have to choose between, you know, spitting on soldiers uh, as if that, you know, ever happened and, uh, and being uh, against war. Uh, I, I, this idea that the wars are for the benefit of the young men and women that we lie to uh, and recruit uh, and, and go and subject to these wars with this so-called volunteer, voluntary army, uh, you know, there, there is intense recruitment to get people to join this madness. They have no other economic options, and they are lied to and told they will not be going into war, and they are sent repeatedly, and they are driven insane by it, uh, and they need uh, our help and support, beginning with ending these wars. Uh, and, you know, the, the single biggest killer of active duty is suicide. Uh, you know, this is, not, this is not glorious. This is not something to hold a parade about. I can't tell you how many interviews where the media asked me to get outraged about urinating on corpses, and I said, I will not do it. I am outraged about creating the corpses. You, we, uh, we have accepted mass murder. We have accepted mass murder and we get upset when somebody does it uh, less than delicately. Uh, you know, we, ha we have to treat mass murder as mass murder and people who engage in it are engaging in a crime and we should celebrate those who do their legal duty and refuse to go. Now, this, this compulsion of Americans to sanitize uh, what U.S. troops do, in, especially in non-white uh, countries, uh, says a lot about the American psyche. 
Uh, it goes way beyond whatever pen, uh, Pentagon policy is. Even uh, with the massacre of these, uh, recent massacre of these 16 Afghans, uh, we find uh, this, this reflexive um, uh, tendency uh, to talk about how the, uh, if it is a lone GI, the lone GI was damaged by his service uh, three tours in Iraq and, and, and now in Afghanistan. And no doubt he was damaged. Killing people uh, is damaging to the soul. Uh, but one could say that about SS troops in World War II, that they were damaged by all the atrocities that they uh, committed. Nobody would, uh, in fact, people would think, I, I, I believe they would think it was kind of uh, horrible, however, uh, to uh, focus on uh, the psychological harm that uh, that German policy did uh, to SS troops, uh, as opposed to uh, the victims of, of SS troops. Uh, Americans don't seem to, uh, to, to see the, it's not irony, uh, uh, to see this, this situation. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to mention on that note, uh, something that uh, Medea was talking about in the very beginning, about uh, the, the Afghans having, uh, out of their 158 battalions, only one is prepared uh, to fight alone and how that is treated as, woo, such a tragedy. And nobody thinks uh, to ask the question, do the people Afgan of Afghanistan want those 158 uh, battalions made up of people from Afghanistan uh, to be fighting uh, in perpetuity against other Afghans who might be Taliban or some other uh, outfit. Uh, clearly, that is the most important question. Uh, do the Afghans want this war to go on forever? Uh, would they approve of, of a more independent and self-contained uh, military uh, that could just uh, uh, continue this war for, forever, even if the United States is gone? Uh, I don't think they would, but that's not even a question uh, as far as the American public is concerned. I'm not talking about U.S. policy, but the way the American public uh, uh, thinks about U.S. interactions with the people of the world. And I first punted this question because I don't watch MSNBC anymore. And maybe it's a sad commentary, but a good one, that living in Washington, D.C., without even having cable or dish, I can get Al Jazeera and Russia TV. Um, how do you think the anti-war movement responded to the U.S. and NATO bombing of Libya? For example, two weeks ago I attended the Occupy APAC conference, and I was very disappointed, but not surprised by some of the comments I heard. Some of them were very polite demonizations of Libya, Jabal Maria, and uh, Gaddafi himself. Thank you. I think it, primarily it didn't respond uh, to its great shame. Uh, I think we have the insane idea that there are good wars and bad wars, that there are good reasons to bomb people's cities and bad ones. Uh, and when, when the peace movement in the 1920s uh, passed a treaty ratified by all the wealthy nations, the armed nations of the world, uh, banning war, uh, the subject of this book, uh, they very intentionally, after long debate, banned all war, not aggressive war. They said, look, we, we are outgrowing blood feuds, uh, physical violence of all forms, dueling as a way to settle individual disputes. And we didn't ban aggressive dueling and keep defensive dueling. We said we are outgrowing dueling. We are going to outgrow war. And, and, so, we, and so we renounced all war. In, in, in very ironically, this, you know, this did prevent some wars. It ended the, the acceptance of territory gained through war and so forth. But ironically, it resulted in the first ever prosecution for the crime of war after World War II uh, as the crime of aggressive war, which was specifically what the treaty had not created. Uh, and we have a very hard time post-World War II when the wars are U.S. wars and we're constantly making war and it's the primary function of our government to get back to the idea that all war, including wars on poor countries, right? We, uh, with that exception of World War II, we, we haven't had wars among the rich countries. I mean, we've ended them, but we still have all these wars against the poor countries, uh, which were not part of the treaty. Uh, and we seem to accept that. We, 
my, my congressman from 08 to, to 2010, Tom Perriello, great hero of all the national progressive groups, God knows why, uh, I think because uh, I live in such a terrible district and he was not quite as terrible as we are, uh, it, it loves these wars, holds up the first Gulf War, Kosovo and Libya as the model of what we should do and argues from Rwanda, we should have been in Rwanda, but we shouldn't have bombed Rwanda. Maybe we should have had police go into Rwanda. What, what these people want, what people like Tom Periello, who's one of the founders of Avas, which is pushing for war in Syria, want is bombing, bombing of other countries uh, without law, without Congress, without the, the United Nations. Uh, they pretend falsely that the Libya authorization from the United Nations was for the overthrow of a government. It was not. It was just used for it. Uh, and they pretend that we can build nations by bombing them, which, you know, with the exception of Germany and Japan, which we first burned to the ground and haven't left yet, we haven't built a nation anywhere by bombing anybody. Uh, and the idea that we're going to go into Syria and give them the paradise that Libya now has uh, is, is insane. It is not, while a nonviolent resistance in a place like Bahrain that nobody has turned violent yet doesn't get a word. Nobody demonizes the king of Bahrain. It's selective, who, you know, who's a worthy victim and who's not. Uh, it, it is complete hypocrisy. Uh, and until we get rid of the idea that there could be a good war, we can't get rid of the trillion dollars a year going to prepare for that possibility. So we have to get back to the understanding that our grandparents had that there's no such thing as a good war. Obama, the phony anti-war candidate, uh, quickly made his uh, position uh, clear once people were calling him an anti-war candidate by his clarification was that he wasn't against war, he was against dumb wars. And uh, as president, uh, he has shown that he is at the top of his class of nomenclatura by simply relabeling uh, wars. And so, uh, as Bush said, he was fighting his wars for democracy. Uh, Obama goes him much, one much, much better by saying that his wars are humanitarian interventions. And he thus, thus creates a huge exemption to the rule of law that David was just talking about. As long as you say that, you're, that your intentions are humanitarian, uh, then to hell uh, with the rule of law as it, as it has evolved over centuries. And as the United States was so instrumental uh, in repackaging it after World War II. Uh, but the, yes, the anti-war movement's ambivalence at best uh, about Libya uh, plays right into the hands of, of the annihilator of international law, uh, Barack Obama. And he goes one further than saying it was uh, a humanitarian military intervention, uh, but claims that it was not a war at all. So some wars just do not exist. And the ant much of the anti-war movement also pretends that some wars are not real wars. Now, I'm uh, happy and proud to say that uh, UNAC, uh, in its uh, position, uh, which you'll hear about next weekend in Stamford, Connecticut, uh, has called for uh, no attack against Syria, no embargo against Syria, that Syria is also covered by international law, that there will be uh, no exemption. And we would hope that others who claim to be anti-warriors will do the same. Okay, how about, we're running out of time. I'm gonna take one from over there. You haven't asked one yet. Yes, and one from in the middle, but, okay, and over there. And that's it. I'm going to have you make your short question or comments together, and then we'll get a response because we have to get out of the room soon. Okay, two questions if possible. Short. I'd like to know your opinion on how we can get the Occupy movement to embrace the no war alliance and the Okay, um, and Bob, short, short comment or question. Uh, one of the most, 
the strongest argument we can make to the American people in opposing a war with Iran is that it would double the cost of gasoline or more. And I don't hear, you know, we're not doing much organizing around that issue, but that's the strongest issue we have because before the Iraq war, gas was a buck and a half. And the Iraq war doubled it, and the Iran war would double it again, and the American people don't want to pay more to come. All right, good comment. You want to react to the uh, first question? Well, I'll take them together in that I think we have to maybe have a national day of teach-ins at the occupations where we take on this issue of Iran head-on and we talk about it in terms of the personal catastrophe as well as the economic one. Um, education, education. You know, Michael Moore said to us last night that we, quote, won already on the issue of uh, having the public on our side. In the case of Iran, we have not won, so we have to uh, uh, work on that one. I also want to say there's other opportunities, which is the NATO summit coming up in Chicago, uh, and there are the two national conventions. And I think during this whole electoral season, our job is to go to wherever the, ca the candidates are and unfurl our banners, no war with Iran. Briefly, I'll say that what a commentary it is on the United States of America that the uh, regarding unprovoked war and violations of international law, murder of innocent people, the strongest argument that uh, one can make is to invoke uh, American monetary interests. <laughs> I intended my opening remarks today as an appeal to the Occupy movement uh, to understand the centrality of going after the military industrial complex and those remarks will be on warisacrime.org within an hour. I intended my remarks on a panel here yesterday on elections uh, to address the question of uh, Rocky Anderson and Jill Stein, whom, both of whom I know and like. Uh, and those remarks are already at warisacrime.org, and uh, in brief, I think there is a value, a very limited, but a value uh, in, in pushing those, those actually good candidates. And I think that pushing the awareness of the impact on uh, the price of gas uh, and the profits uh, for the oil companies uh, is very valuable. But beyond that, it is just scraping the surface of the financial cost and not yet touching the human cost uh, to, uh, you know, it was Stanley McChrystal at a press conference at the Pentagon not long ago who was asked, do the people in Afghanistan who help you out tend to get beheaded? And who said, yeah, but that's to be expected and moved on. <laughs> if that's to be expected, and that's under 1% of the deaths, the deaths are the other people whose countries we are fighting these wars in. We cannot leave out that moral demand. The people in the Occupy plazas are moral activists. They do not just care about the price of gas. They care about it. They care about more than it. So there's, there are a number of arguments we have to make uh, to, get, to get this war prevented. In terms of the uh, Rocky Anderson and Jill Stein, they're going around the country. They're, uh, they're challenging this uh, war drums beating around Iran. I think it's a helpful thing. I'm somewhat of an agnostic when it comes to electoral campaigning. As long as it's part of movement building, I support it. That's why I support Norman Solomon, who's a 40-year anti-war activist who might actually get elected to Congress uh, from the north coast of California. And these third-party candidacies, if they're going around raising the uh, fears of uh, what's going to happen if we attack Iran, and they're getting on radio shows, and they're talking to bigger groups of people than they normally would, well, that's effective organizing. And that's the kind of uh, campaigning that I support. For those of you that came in late, uh, I want you to I want to quickly reintroduce our panel. That's David Swanson. He works with RootsAction.org. We got Glenn Ford from Black Agenda Report. We got Medea Benjamin from Code Pink. I'm Jeff Cohen. I also work with RootsAction.org. RootsAction, if you haven't heard about it, because most of you in this room got in here late, there is a new online activist group that opposes war and warmongering, even if a Democrat is in the White House. What a novel concept. So if you're interested, go to the website of RootsAction.org.